think this is on. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I have the honor of uh, moderating the second panel in this amazing conversation. I, I want to start by really congratulating the Hamilton Project for pulling a wonderful event together. And also, in case you have not read, the Future Work in the Age of the Machine, which I think you put together in record time, if you want a summary of the issues that we're trying to discuss here with a very distinguished uh, set of speakers, read this. It's really a great overview, and it links to everything you need to know. And besides that, they brought everybody here you need to know right here. So I recommend this. OK. Don't let that stop you from reading entire books on this subject. Oh, <laughs> I, I assume that was the price of admission, <laughs> that you actually had to read the, the Second Machine Age. Um, in any event, we, uh, this panel is really going to focus on business innovation. And uh, it's going to focus on it in two ways. One is, you know, what technologies are we really talking about? So much of the conversation is about software coding, a little bit of robots thrown in there occasionally. <laughs> but what technologies really are uh, transforming? Are they enhancing productivity? Have we reached some technological plateau, which some people argue we have? But then, even if the technology is rapidly changing, are our organizations changing rapidly enough? Are we, is our innovative capability to absorb all of this on the decline? And then finally, what are some of the business models that might work to actually help us absorb all of this and make the most of us, make the most of it for, for all of us? So that's what we're going to do. And I will start with uh, someone I think a number of you know very well, John Haltewanger. He has done a lot of really important work documenting the fact that the pace of innovation in organizations in the United States may be declining, that entrepreneurship may be stagnating, that labor market fluidity may be less than it has been. And believe me, you lead fluid labor markets to make the most of this. I thought I would start a question to John by making an observation that Eric and Andrew make, which is that in the face of rapid technological change, so let's assume that is happening for a minute, uh, the benefit will not go to labor, and it won't go to capital as we traditionally know it. It will go to entrepreneurial people and entrepreneurial organizations who can create new products, new services, and new business models. But I think John's worried about whether we, our capacity to do any or all of these things is declining. So John, is it declining? Why? And what are the implications that if you've got a stagnant sort of structure trying to absorb this rapid technological change? So thank you. It, 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 it's great to be here. When you, I think all of us, when we get a chance to listen to Eric and Andrew, we're, we're struck by the sort of the gee whiz aspects of all the, the rapid technological changes. And then, but then we also heard in the first panel, I think nicely, some of the skepticism is it doesn't seem to be showing up in, in key numbers like productivity statistics. And, and I think actually the the evidence on the declining entrepreneurship and declining dynamism in the United States economy may actually be part of why we're not seeing it in those numbers, and also raises questions, again, about whether the US is well poised to deal with this. So, so if we were having this discussion, in fact, a number of these people in this room uh, were having this discussion back in the 1990s. So, so we have lots of folks here who were, played important policy roles back in the 1990s. And the, and the US was just surging in, in, in the 1990s in terms of both productivity growth and jobs growth, and, and real earnings growth was doing OK. This was sort of before the great departure. And, and I have quotes from some of the notable uh, uh, policy people in the room, including folks on this, on this panel, uh, <laughs> that, that indicate uh, where they were giving speeches and saying, well, why was the US so, doing so well in, in the 1990s? And, and oftentimes, the two words that were, were used by uh, the, these distinguished policymakers were, the dynamism and the flexibility uh, of, of the U.S. economy. And, and, and so, what, so, so what have we sort of seen historically? Well, one thing we know about innovation, at least from what we sort of see in the data, I'm someone who looks a lot at the micro data of businesses, is innovation and productivity growth is a very noisy and complex process. It's not just, here's some new idea come along, and, and we've talked about it. it takes maybe many years to figure out how to use it. And, and, and that, that noisiness, that complexity, at least historically has, for the United States, has been that when we have booming times and booming sectors, we see a very high pace of entrepreneurship and lots of volatility. And, and also what's kind of striking about the, the nature of that volatility is 
you know, again back in the 1990s, it's only a small fraction of businesses that make it. And so what, again, a striking feature of the United States economy is we, we, we have the surge in, in, in good times, surge of entrepreneurship and dynamism, and a very small fraction make it. And then, then the other feature of the US economy, this is sort of, I'm talking about the dynamism part, is the flexibility part. Well, what this means is that there, there's lots of restructuring that's going on in the United States economy as a result of all this kind of volatility. And the US has been quite flexible and fluid in terms of being able to move workers to, to, to other kinds of, uh, of uh, productive uses. And the fluidity has actually helped, I'll say, we gotta remember, it's not just businesses that are experimenting, workers themselves experiment. What, a key, key way that, that workers build their careers is job hopping. So we know that particularly young workers, the, the, the way they find the, the, the right match in the labor market, it's not just at the high end, all over the place. It's where, where, where earnings go up um, and where, again, they find good life, you could say lifetime careers, is, is through lots of job hopping. So it should at least cause us concern that, that we see now in the data several indicators, I'll say, of dynamism and fluidity down, especially since 2000. Now, some of these have been going on before that, but it's especially in 2000 where things have accelerated. So what have we seen? We've seen a decline in entrepreneurship, um, actually that predates 2000, but, but, it, but in key sectors like the, the tech sector, it was actually rising through 2000, and then it's fallen. And some of you might say, well, is that, was that the dot-com bubble? No, it's not just that. If you actually look at the data, there, entrepreneurship was rising through the 1990s in, 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 in the high-tech sector. Then it has this sort of little mountain peak where everybody was apparently starting a dot-com business, and then, and then it came down. And, and, and again, if you look at entrepreneurship in 2005, it's lower than it was in 1995. All right. And so... John, can I jump in? Is it yeah. on the upswing since 2005? No, it's, it's, it continued to decline. That seems... How can that be true? We hear about okay. crazy internet billionaires every... Okay, I'm, so, I'm honestly puzzled. Okay, so... so, so, so uh, yes, so, so when, I, when I talk about an entrepreneur, I am talking about a, a, about a new business that hires at least one worker. Okay. All right, so, so, so I, what I've been doing and, and others have been doing is tracking yep. the number of businesses that, that hire at least one worker. And, and again, the U.S. is, uh, 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 what we've seen, uh, I'll say, is that they, these, these entrepreneurs, as, 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 as so defined, have been critical for job creation and productivity growth and innovation, with this uh, large pace of entrepreneurs coming in and a small fraction really taking off and disproportionately creating lots of jobs and, um, and being high in, in, in terms of innovation and productivity. So we, again, we've seen a decline uh, in, in the, in the, in the post-2000 period that's continued. And because the Great Recession was insult oh, to injury. Yeah. So, so young, young businesses were already on their way down pre-recession, and they just got hammered, and they've been slow, slow to recover. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we're obviously concerned about what, what this might mean for productivity, uh, er, earnings, and, and wage growth. And so do, do we fully understand this, this decline at this point? And the, and the answer is I'm, I'm happy during the questions and so on in the, in the panel to talk about what are ideas? But let me just talk briefly about what we know about both the causes and consequences. Obviously, the consequences are going to depend upon the causes. So, so one thing that we see, um, that one, work, one, one thing that we've done in, in work that I did with Steve Davis that was, was presented at, a, at, a, at the Jackson Hole Conference last, uh, last August, is we look carefully at the impact of this decline in dynamism and labor market fluidity for a, something that was on, the, on a topic of the first panel, which is unemployment rates. And, we, and what we found is that it, it looks like they're closely connected. So this decline in employment rates that we talked a lot about in the first panel has been especially for young and less educated workers, and especially young, less educated males. And what we found is, in the, it turns out there's lots of variation across states in where we've seen this decline in dynamism and fluidity. And what we found is the states with the biggest declines in dynamism and fluidity are exactly the states that have had the biggest declines in, uh, uh, in, in the employment rates for young, less educated males. And we pushed it even further. I'm not going to go talk about uh, detailed econometrics here, but we try to use instrumental variable procedures to try to, to, try to generate causal effects. And in, in fact, our, our results were consistent with that. So, so, so that already says that, that it looks like there's at least some adverse consequences. The second thing we've done is, we, is we've tried to look at what the productivity implications of all this are. So, so one, one possibility of this decline in dynamism and entrepreneurship is you might say, well, maybe the business model in the United States has changed. Maybe we don't need to do so much experimentation as we used to. That maybe we've even gotten better, so we don't, you know, because a lot of that was waste, right? You have a, this massive set of entrepreneurs come in, 
Many of them fail. Uh, a very costly reallocation. Maybe we got better. Maybe even information technology has, has, an, ha, has made that, uh, le, le, we need less of that. So, so one way to look at that is what, what we've seen in the, in the data, at the microdata, is that we've seen that, uh, that there's lots of dispersion in productivity across firms. That, that's actually very much what's driving the dynamism. That's consistent with economic theory. So again, you get this wave of entrance in. Lots of them are experimenting. Some of them do very well. They take off. Some of them are not doing so well. Um, they shrink and contract. So, so what we want to do is just go look at, at, at the dispersion and productivity across businesses, particularly young businesses, and particularly young businesses in high tech. So one possibility is maybe that, dis that dispersion has declined, that the business model has changed, so we just don't need to see so much of that. Actually, what we've seen in the data is exactly the opposite. If anything, dispersion and productivity of businesses has gone up rather than down. So there's actually a need for more reallocation rather than less reallocation. Mm -hmm. so, so something's causing... If, if, at the end of the day, it's not that the shock's hitting businesses, and you could say not that the technological changes have slowed down. So this is kind of consistent with the story we're hearing, but the responsiveness of businesses to this change has slowed down. And again, that has, by, by construction, that has adverse consequences for productivity. So at least in a mechanical sense, part of the way we were getting productivity gains, and we always get productivity gains, is we were moving resources away from less productive to more productive businesses. We're just not doing that as much as we used to. So a question, and I don't expect, uh, not an answer now, but a question to put out there to try to relate to the, to the previous discussion, is to what extent what might you think that this, uh, these amazing changes in technology that are labor displacing, uh, or potentially labor displacing, actually are discouraging the formation of a entrepreneurial venture with one person. What's the, what's the point? I mean, a lot of the entrepreneurial ventures with one person are very labor intensive local things. And if you can do those things online, you don't need the local entrepreneur and the one person that that person hires. And by the way, I would, I would link that to the fact that a lot of those one person shops, they're more like mom and pop shops. A lot of them are founded by women there's a whole issue here of labor force participation rates of women stagnating uh, around 2000, right around 2000. Exactly. Okay, so boom, what's happening there? So technology and as a cause of this uh, not, is something to think about. But let's, let's go from there to technology and to RT. We have here the, president, the head of, the, uh, of DARPA, a very well-known source of technological innovation in the United States. And, Economists tend to, when they're looking at this technology, technological change, tend to raise two issues. One is it's not showing up in the productivity numbers. We heard that very eloquently in the first panel. The other is just, you know what? These technologies are all not that important. We're not doing major innovations in health. We're not doing major innovations in transportation and energy. Nothing similar to electrification or telephonic communication. What's the big deal, right? So I don't think we have a better person than RT to sort of talk about um, these pessimistic views of technology coming from the economics community and your sense of where the big technological changes are, are coming from. And is it all IT and software? That, uh, that's very much what I'd love to talk about. Thank you, Laura. Let me just first say how much I appreciate the chance to participate in this dialogue. Um, the work that uh, you and Eric have done, Andy, and then uh, the Hamilton Project. I think we're talking about unraveling this complicated l set of linkages between technology and work, and it's so core to what is important for our country, for our values, and for our future. So I, I really think this is terrific. I want to take the conversation a very different direction and talk about technology itself. Um, you know, the word technology um, has almost become synonymous. Many people use it synonymously with information technology. If you read the New York Times, their, their technology section is only about information technology. Everything else is relegated to the science section. But in fact, technology is much, much broader than that. And uh, what I thought I'd do is take a few minutes and just share with you some, some perspectives about the, the bubbling pot of things that are happening in some very, very different areas. First of all, let me just say that there is a lot more to be said about the technology factors driving the many dimensions of information technology. We can come back to that, but let me just set that aside. Uh, let me give you some very different examples. Uh, one is something that is uh, bubbling today in the maker movement. Um, part of that is new tools like 3D printing, which everyone has talked a lot about. But part of it, too, is, is finding different ways to make those kinds of 
tools available to lots of people. One example is a tech shop uh, here in Alexandria, Virginia that we at DARPA uh, helped get started uh, a little while ago. We co-funded it uh, working with the Veterans Administration in part to be able to provide uh, a gym membership-like access to the tech shop here for veterans. Uh, so for about what it costs to belong to a gym, they or anyone else actually can, can um, have access to advanced 3D printers, but also sewing machines and welding tools and every kind of production equipment, a, a wonderful machine shop. Uh, and I went by to visit there right before Christmas. Uh, I wanted to just get a sense of the vibe there. And one of my most engaging conversations was with a young fellow who's in high school. He found out about tech shops somehow. He drives an hour and a half each way, many times a week, as often as he can break away, to come to the tech shop and to build things. And I said, well, so what do you do with these things? And he said, well, I put them up on Pinterest and all my friends and my family buy them. So I got his business card and I raced home and it was right before Christmas. I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll buy something that he built. And it turns out I don't know anyone who wants uh, accessories for guns to play paintball, which is pretty much what he was building. <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, it just so that's what's happening today is people are experimenting. Uh, this is a kid who, who's finding a way to build a business. It, I don't know what tomorrow holds. It might be something that, that broadens and taps the skills and the energies and the creativity of new sets of communities. That would be awesome. I don't really know yet if that's going to happen, but that's one, one thing that's bubbling. A, a major area of research um, that we're very excited about uh, at DARPA because we think it holds the seeds for technological surprise, that's our business, uh, is that's happening today in research as biology is intersecting with the information sciences and technology, but also the physical science and technology world. And uh, let me give you two examples of things that are happening, and I'll tell you what's happening today, but also try to take you out into what I think could be a very wild uh, future. Uh, let me start with synthetic biology. This is, of course, the, is the ability to engineer microorganisms to create chemistries and materials that the world has never seen before, uh, doing it in dishes and then trying to scale it up and do it, doing it in factories. So what is happening today is we're able to build new specialty chemicals, new medicines, um, and a, a very interesting beginning, but in fact, it's only a beginning. Uh, we can see in these capabilities, we can see a progression of, of new materials, chemistries, but also functional systems and self-repairing systems. We can imagine a future where you might be able, in your built environment, you might live in a building in which the walls are able to sense the environment around them, adjust temperature and humidity and lighting conditions. Uh, these walls might support microbial communities that can disinfect the air, uh, that can purify the air. Uh, they might be materials that can self-repair so that, you know, when your teenager sort of puts a gouge in the wall, it could, it could fix itself. And, and when the time comes and when you want to, the wall could biodegrade and, and not create, you know, this, this sort of perpetual waste that we live with today. So, you know, that all sounds a little crazy, but imagine a century ago if someone had told you about some magical new PVC material that was going to be super lightweight and incredibly easy to work with, but would be able to be so corrosion resistant that it would change the way you do plumbing. It, that would have seemed a little crazy. And I think today, some of these things that seem crazy might become actually, uh, I think technically they look like they might become possible. And then of course, how we turn those into businesses and products is another question. Let me finish with an example from neurotechnologies, another area where biology and technology are coming together in some very exciting ways. And we're just at the very beginning of this adventure of understanding the brain and how to harness its amazing capabilities. Uh, today, much of our work in this area is about the restoration of function. Uh, but in that work, you can start imagining what might be possible out into the future. Um, one of our areas of focus here has been revolutionizing prosthetics, moving beyond the simple hook that's been the standard of care for many years for upper, upper limb prosthetics. Um, to pursue that, that vision, our program manager developed a very sophisticated robotic hand with many degrees of freedom. Um, and that was one branch of it. But because he's a neuroscientist, he also did the research that helped us understand how neural signaling from the motor cortex actually controls that arm. That work culminated in some early human trials, and most notably a woman named Jan who lives in Pittsburgh, who's a quadriplegic, volunteered to have uh, these two small implants surgically placed on the surface of her brain on the motor cortex. 
and from that, neural signals are directly picked up, and in real time, as she thinks, she's able to move this arm, and she can shake hands, she can give you a fist bump, she can offer you a stack of cookies with this robotic arm just by thinking about it. So it, first and foremost, of course, the, the healthcare implications in that dimension, but many other dimensions of restoring function as we understand the brain, um, that's going to be amazing in itself. But as we do this work, of course, we also understand that we, we have opened a door that could free the brain from the limitation of the body. And uh, as, as we start thinking about what else is going to be possible beyond restoration of function, uh, we actually open, I think, some amazing possibilities. Some are going to be great, and some of them are going to be terrifying. And I think the societal issues there are going to actually they're going to make the work issues we're dealing with today look simple. So you know, there are the technology has many quandaries that it raises. Uh, but I hope uh, some of those ideas give you a sense of the, the very wide range of things that uh, are happening today that could lead to alternative futures. So you mentioned the, the work issues and, and uh, another set, and then you mentioned that there are other issues that we're not even thinking about. There are also issues that you obviously think a lot about too, and those would be in the realm of national security. And you, you, you didn't mention that as an area, but I think that's one we might want to, to talk about. Behind everything we're doing. Right. Um, so one of the things that comes to mind in thinking about technology and moving to business models is a concern that I have, and I think many Americans have, about how we finance basic science and applied science, and whether we are doing enough, and because we're pulling back on the support for basic science. This gets to Andrew in the following way. The most research and development in the United States, most spending, is done by the private sector, not by the public sector. And actually, most of the private sector is done by very large companies. It's done, 85% of the R&D spend in the United States of the private sector is done by the US multinational companies that are big. Okay. Now, this gets to Andrew, because Andrew is concerned that the existing companies cannot cope with the new technologies, and that we have to develop whole new organizational structures and business models to, to take advantage of. But remember, right now, we have this situation where we got the government doing the basic science and, and being very resistant to doing more and wanting to do less and wanting to know right the business model is right away. And then we have these very large companies who you're worried about they won't be able to make it. Um, so uh, talk a little bit about what kinds of companies and how would they support their ongoing investment in R&D, unless you become huge overnight, like Google or Apple, and then you're running your own venture capital firm, your own R&D facility, your own everything. And can I just highlight, first of all, how interesting this panel is? I say this with no pride, because I haven't started talking yet. <laughs> um, but but think, look what we're hearing about. We're hearing about this time of, of deep technological ferment, which is such unbelievably good news, coupled with institutional sclerosis. Mm -hmm. This is weird. It's bad news in a lot of ways. John, as you pointed out, we don't fully understand this phenomenon at all. I, I really don't understand why at a time when the tools of entrepreneurship are really good, more widely available than ever, and getting better all the time, the makerspace you described is a really good example of that, it's on the decline in this country. This is a deep, deep puzzle, and we better spend some time figuring out. A lot of it is completely opaque to me. Some of it is clear. Some of it is self-inflicted damage. Some of our ways of approaching the situation and our reactions to it are making the sclerosis worse. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, pray for the people of Cambridge right now, by the way. Um, I, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and this, the city council in Cambridge made a very sincere effort last year to specifically ban Uber from operating in the city of Cambridge. They wanted the taxis to continue. They wanted nothing but the taxis to be able to pick up anybody in the city of Cambridge. I think my head came close to exploding when I heard about this. I, I, I have trouble imagining a worse response to this situation that we're in, because Uber is a very controversial company. I think their management has, has done themselves no favors in some ways. But I want to go on record as saying I love Uber. 
Uber and its business model, not just as a, a person who likes to get from point A to point B, but the more I understand about the opportunities they're providing to put labor back in the economy and to provide a decent living for people, the bigger fan I become of the company. Uh, Laura, you probably saw the study that Alan Kruger just worked on and published, where he says that the average Uber driver, the comparison is a little bit difficult to make. Pretty clear they get paid at least as much per hour as a cabbie does. Per hour, they get paid at least as much. They have great flexibility about how many hours they want to work. In contrast to almost all other part-time workers, they appear not to suffer a penalty on a per-hour basis from working fewer hours. You make 15 bucks if you drive three hours. You make 15 bucks an hour if you drive 30 hours a week. These are all really good things to have, especially to the point that, that Larry was making earlier. If we, if we want to bring jobs and demand back, here is a platform that's bringing jobs and demand back. The, the harshly negative reactions to it honestly don't make any sense to me. And I get the idea that some people kind of want to legislate secure jobs in the middle class back into existence. I think that's a fundamentally misguided approach. Now, the question you brought up was, are, are, are today's great big successful companies going to be able to navigate this transition that a lot of us feel is beginning? And the pattern of history is not an encouraging one. When we look back at these big technology trends, uh, steam to electricity being the most recent big one that we went through, the pattern is fairly clear that the companies that are on top at the beginning are usually not the companies that are on top at the end. And there appear to be two main reasons for that. One is financial. When you've got a factory totally set up for steam, it's really hard to get out your sharp pencil and justify the, the retrofitting for this weird new thing called electricity. That's part of it. The deeper problem is a mindset problem. And that if you're used to thinking about a factory as this build, building with a big thing in the basement and belts and pulleys that drive your machines, when some weirdo shows up with an electric motor, you say that thing is less powerful, costs more per horsepower, whatever. Why would I do that? You don't see the opportunity to get rid of those belts and pulleys and eventually replace them with overhead cranes and assembly lines and things like that. The mindset challenge is a really severe challenge. As I look around at a lot of very successful, well-managed companies today, I see that mindset challenge coming up over and over. The, the one example I'll give, one of, the, one of my messages to to large established enterprises is you, your management needs to become a lot geekier. And by that, I mean a lot more driven by the numbers, a lot more rigorous, a lot more evidence-based in things like human resources, where the dominant mode right now is you interview me and you look deep into my eyes and judge my character and my fit for the job and make a recommendation based on that. We've got ample evidence. That's a terrible way to make human capital decisions. Being a lot more analytical and a lot more geeky is the right way to do it. Today's managers didn't grow up with that toolkit. They didn't get to where they are by virtue of their, their geekiness and their familiarity with quantitative stuff. So that particular transition, I think, is going to be difficult. There are a lot of ones that feel similarly challenging to me. So I, I think a huge open question is whether today's successful enterprises are going to navigate into this technologically very different future. I, th I think some of them certainly will. I think a lot of them are really going to struggle. Okay. Can, can I uh, sort of connect uh, your, your question, Andrew, which is this, this, this confusion, and I, I agree with it about sort of the, the, the technolo technology not only changing rapidly but creating all kinds of enabling technologies like, and I think the makers was a wonderful example, and yet this decline in entrepreneurship. Might that be, John, how have you looked at the issue just of the overall demand level in the economy? Let's go to Larry's point. So Larry's point is a very important point. The overall macroeconomic climate here is in fact possibly the biggest determinant. I mean, productivity doesn't change that fast, and it's, it's uh, but the macro conditions in terms of the uh, excess demand or excess supply in the labor market um, can actually change. And then I think about 2000 and then 2007, a lot of mom and pop entrepreneurs, particularly in 2007, there was no bank capital for these people, absolutely none. You could not keep your establishment open uh, from one day to the next because your demand fell off the cliff and your ability to finance fell off the cliff at exactly the same time. So I wonder how, John, in terms of thinking, maybe it hasn't, the technology may be enabling, but if you don't have the demand for your product and you don't have the financing to set up your little enterprise, which may someday be Google, you can't do it. 
So I think that that's right. All, all those factors are right. And I think that's, but I think that's mostly a post-2007 story, right? And so, so I, and I think that's really important. I mean, the, 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 the Great Recession I mean, clobbered the whole US economy, and especially clobbered uh, young uh, businesses for exactly the reasons that you're talking about. But, but this was going on before that. I would say, uh, we would say that we, we've seen, let's say, the decline in, in dynamism and fluidity and the decline in employment rates uh, and the decline in productivity predates this. That, was it the usual suspects for why yes. that is? Okay, so, so, yes. so, so, um, so this is going to be a, uh, very much uh, the two-handed economist kind of thing. On the one hand, uh, 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 on the other hand, uh, what, what, what might be going on? So one, one or more, or sort of more benign uh, interpretations, but, but may actually have adverse implications for the United States. We talked about this in the, in the first panel. I think David Otter in particular talked about this. So we, we have seen this big shift away from young small businesses towards more large uh, mature businesses, particularly the multinationals. So their share is going up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one can make the case that actually what IT has been especially good yeah. is it's enabled the multinationals to be able, and, and, and Eric talked about this as well, to be able to communicate with all their activities around the world instantaneously. And so as a result, the question is, uh, the, the big guys are, are saying, well, maybe, maybe the US isn't the best place to do all these things. There's other places. Maybe that's actually even good for the world economy, but, but the US is going through some disruption uh, kind of factor. The, the second thing that does seem to be going on that again, that again may be associated with the change in the business model, I don't know, this is not so much of an explanation, is, is again, one of the, it's, it's good to remember that, that, that most entrepreneurs fail and only a small fraction really grew rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so, was, again, what was really striking in the data was, was these fast grow, these high growth young firms that played such a vital role in the, I'll say, say in the 80s and the 90s. We, we, we've seen, I don't wanna say a disappearance of high growth young firms, but a tremendous decline and high growth young firms. So, so, and so, 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 Google, so Google and Facebook are distracting us from the real story. So, so they're so, exceptions. So well, one question is whether the, the business model now is, maybe it used to be you wanted to be Google, and now the business model is, I want to be bought up by Google. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, and uh, now, that may not, you, you could make a case, maybe that's not such a bad thing. That's a change in the business model. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but then again, if, there was, if this is all good news, if this is all uh, entirely benign, then, then why are the productivity statistics so bad? So, th so then now let me go on the other hand of things, you know, where, where, where are we looking? Well, the, the, the obvious concern is, is the U.S. Through, through, you know, has it changed its business climates, its regulations, its, its, its labor market uh, 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 regulations in some fashion so that we, we've seen this gradual decline? And we're working on that, and I, and, and I think we, we find some evidence of this. Now, I think in, in trying to think about that question, it's useful to think about all the cross-country studies that have been done on this. So on the one hand, we have now, I'll say, increasing evidence that countries that are successful are precisely those countries which, which have this successful productivity enhancing reallocation. So that, that countries that are not doing well are, are countries in which they have lots of dispersion and productivity and they're just not able to get resources to the most productive businesses. It's actually been harder, so, so I think, and that all suggests the, we know countries differ quite a bit in terms of their business climate and labor market regulations and all the rest. We have financial markets and so on. So, so, so we're, we're pretty convinced that, that, that this matters a lot in terms of whether a country is successful or not. We struggled a lot more actually finding, even in cross-country evidence, of finding exactly what are the causes associated with why this country uh, seems to have a, a, a bad environment relative to the other. So, so, in, so, so one view that's, that's increasingly been taken in kind of in the macro development community is, is to think about this like a death by a thousand cuts. Lots of little things. So don't look for one big thing. And in fact, I, I don't think there's any evidence, there's, there's no evidence there's, there's a big smoking gun that says, ah, the US suddenly did something around 2000, and so we're, we're seeing this decline. So, so I, I think we are beginning to look at some smaller things. So, so what are two smaller things that looks like they, may, they actually might matter? And at least it's suggestive we need to, we need to push harder on this. And this is, this is not a, a complete explanation. So one of them actually builds upon David Otter's work. So David, David had done work like this and we, we took, took it and applied it particularly to our more recent data and, and also applied it, um, you know, I sort of say, to this more comprehensive data than some of his earlier work. So in, in one, one part of David's very nice, you've got a lot of nice uh, research contributions. 
is, is he found that been, there has been an erosion of employment at will doctrine in the United States through, through precedents in the US court system that, that made its way sort of gradually through the, the nature of how, how judicial precedents are set in some states before other states. And it's precisely that variation that allows you to identify these effects. And in his work, and then we, we followed up, that actually looks like it's associated with this decline in dynamism. So that work, that's at least working in the right direction. That's not saying this is the whole story. It's just at least saying, oh yeah, you, you actually can see. Here's, here's one, of the, one of the thousand cuts that we're looking at. The second one we've just started to look at is, is inspired by very recent work by, uh, by Kruger and Kleiner. And, and, and that's this work that occupational licensing requirements have risen dramatically in the United States over the last couple of decades. And, it's, and those are the kind of regulations where you can easily imagine, oh, wait a second, that's exactly the kind of thing that, that, that again, could sort of stifle the kind of regulation. We even heard a little bit about this on the first panel. Not, it wasn't on, on uh, occupational licensing, but it was on the permit process. So the so a question is, has the U.S. become more sclerotic? This, will be the, this is our, our worst nightmare, of course. It's become more sclerotic because of accumulation of problems in, in, uh, in, in the way things are working. I don't, I'm not going to argue that I think we, we, we know this for sure now, um, but, but, I, but I am going to come back and say, uh, one, we've seen this decline in dynamism, and two, the, when we look at the productivity statistics at the micro level, we actually ought to be seeing an increase in, in, in dynamism, not a decrease. That, that almost can't be good news. <laughs> no. um, one uh, follow-up here. Do, do you have a you suggested that you're looking cross-country. Historically speaking, for a very long time, the view was that by far the U.S. was the most entrepreneurial, most innovative, most fluid. Uh, so who's surpassing us now? Or is maybe we're just less, but our gap to, so our gap of excellence has declined, but we're still number one. I, I think it's more the latter, by the way. I think it's actually you, more you that, the, I don't, I don't okay. think that, that, that the rest of the world okay is necessarily ha has become that much more dynamic and entrepreneurial. And, 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 and Eric tried to push this nicely before. You gotta remember, things are, are, are not that dire in the United States, at least on the, on the aggregate productivity statistics. They've right. slowed down, but, but, but we're, we're not in a crisis. We are, I say, in a crisis in terms of employment rates. So the point that came up employment that, rates. that, that uh, Larry, Larry Summers, and, and, and I think that is connected to this. So, so again, my, my concern about this decline in dynamism and flexibility is, I'll say it, I'll say it at the, both at the top and the bottom. At the top, it's, it's, it's are, we, are we poised to take advantage of all these technological changes, or is, this, or is that gonna happen elsewhere, or, or are we gonna fall behind, or at least not be as successful, for example, as we were in the, in the 1990s, where, we're, where the economy was rocking. But I'm, I'm probably even more concerned about what's going on at the bottom end, because the lack of fluidity and, and dynamism means that we, we know there's disruption that goes on in all this, and it doesn't seem like we're accommodating that nearly so well. And the, and, and the workers who get caught up in this, I, what, was, what used to be happening is, is because we were such a dynamic and flexible economy, other opportunities were arising. They're not, and, and, and so I think they're, they're, they're just not participating in the labor market. So I guess what I would, I would like to say is that another of the many pieces of David Autor's work, which is actually suggests that the issue is not the, there's the issue of demand and the fact that we were running at a very low level of demand, so we had an employment cross, a problem across the skill spectrum. It's increasingly an employment problem that existed before, which is the employment problem of high school dropouts or, but, but in fact, in fact, that issue, and you run a, a sort of high demand, high intensity economy, shows up not in employment numbers, it shows up in poor job numbers. It's, it's about the quality of the job, not the percentage of people who are employed. And you know, if you think about it, uh, if you think about, someone said on the last panel, we have to worry about the fact that the technology itself may be leading to uh, the disruption of jobs uh, that are quality jobs, and then you have caregiving, education, uh, janitorial services, all of the things which actually in a number of the, the periods David was looking at, you saw employment growth there. It's actually pretty strong. It was one of the reasons that unemployment rates in the U.S. fell so far is because low wage jobs, low quality jobs, many of them part time, uh, increased and, and people took them. So that's a demand phenomenon. But then related to the technology thing, the technology is taken out the middle it may be, in David's re more recent work, taking out some of the top, 
in order to run a high employment economy, if the technology is taking out those kinds of jobs, more and more people are going to have to be employed in low-end jobs. Which brings me back to RT to talk a little bit about uh, some, when you think about these technological breakthroughs, they are very, very exciting, but think about them in terms of, I would say, distributional issues. Maybe it's a little unfair, but every time I hear about these prosthetics, I say, how do we as a society decide who gets this stuff? This is not inexpensive stuff. Does everybody get it? And if so, how do we generate the revenue stream for, whoever, for the societal promise that everybody gets to live in their brain outside of their body? Or everybody gets an arm when their original arm no longer can hit, you know, can, can be a, a baseball player level hitter. So those are huge issues. But before we boil that entire ocean, uh, because I think that one we do have a little bit of time to, you know, before it, get, it hits us, uh, we need to be thinking those things through. But I want to come back to uh, what some of these new areas I think will do that I hope, my hope is, I don't think we know, but my hope is that they will create um, a, a uh, a plethora of different kinds of opportunities, because in the information technology world, if the, if the only answer to the challenge is, well, everyone needs to go back to school and learn how to code, that's going to be really good for some people, but it's not going to get you know, everyone in a 300 million person society. So think about you know, t tying it back to maybe some of the things we talked about a minute ago. If you think about synthetic biology, I was talking to a small company a startup that wants to tackle uh, synthetic biology pathways to uh, new specialty chemicals uh, and to enhancing the production of specialty chemicals that people currently already build through more conventional means. That's a company that's 30 people today, but as they think about scaling up, they are going to look more like a traditional chemicals or manufacturing company. They're going to have, yes, absolutely right now, it's very PhD heavy. It'll continue to be a place where lots of smart people with lots of education can get employed, but when they scale up, they will also need technicians and people at all different skill levels uh, with different kinds of skills, coding, but other skills as well. And, and I think that that, uh, you know, I think we're going to really need that kind of diversity of different technological opportunities that lead to this, this whole range of different kinds of skills. I don't know how this is going to play out. And, and, you know, one of the interesting things, coming back to your point about where R&D investment happens, um, as, very much as you said, twice as much of our nation's R&D investment today is made in the private sector versus one-third in government. But that ratio was flipped when we were all small children. So it, it's a trend that I think actually is, is overall healthy, right? Because it, it's good if we have a more innovation-driven economy and more private sector investment in R&D. But that investment, of course, companies make not thinking about the jobs. They make it in order to pursue their business, their business plans and their profits. The, the government part of that investment, I make my share of that for national security objectives. Um, the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health are seeding basic research, but with no particular focus or drive or ability to shape how that turns into jobs. And so, I, you know, in a market economy, these are, there are no um, d formal drivers to shape the way this comes out. And I think that's, that's the richness of our approach, but it, it also, it, 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 it makes it very hard to predict where any of this is going to go. Yes, sure, Dan. Okay. I actually think one of the statistics that is misleading, I mean, you could say maybe all these statistics are misleading, that's why we're, we're, we're struggling here, is, is the statistics on R&D and large businesses. Okay. So, so yeah, that's actually what the numbers show, but I, I think that's, in, I'll say it's enormously misleading. I'll say especially if you go look at in the, in the more high tech sectors, um, you, you, you still don't find that the, the young guys um, are reporting much R&D, and, that, and that's because the, the questionnaires are sort of are, are, uh, gauged and, and, and sort of specified, so if you have an R&D lab, that then you're gonna then you're gonna be able to report all these statistics, but but think think of all the the kind of tech companies we're about here today. They're tiny. They don't have R and D labs. They are the lab. They're they're they're, they're doing everything. And so so I think actually if those if those companies aren't spending basically a hundred percent of their time, indeed that was sort of the the, the vision of of course. Is these are businesses. They have no revenue, but they but they're spending an enormous amount of resources. It's all R and D, and 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 we're not picking that up. So I think actually we're the, this decline, this has gone back in. This decline in entrepreneurship, particularly in the high tech sector, is troubling because I think we're seeing less innovation and less R and D, and we're just not measuring it uh, in, in the statistics. Well, uh, well, measurement 
issues aside, and, and, and in fact, I think, I think we are capturing a lot of that, but measurement issues aside, the, when private companies invest in R&D, it is almost exclusively product development for known markets, and a small fraction of that is going to be the kind of next generation, more exploratory I, I work. Say, so I would also say that, that, the, that the, and this is not to be too critical of the NSF uh, survey on this, it is, it's not that well geared to pick up uh, applied innovation. It's more, it's more geared to pick up uh, core basic research. Yeah. And so that's, that's sort of the second part of where, where I think the mismeasurement is. But, but at the top level, I think, I think we can agree that the, the, this growing corporate share is much more product development driven. And, and, and sure, I agree with that. it still remains government's function to fund the basic research, the university core. Right. And I think that's part of the part of in there. There are many messages that uh, if, if we go to the policy side of this discussion, both in, the, both in the first panel and this, we're all thinking about a world in which uh, the, tech, the pace of technological change has picked up. Things we can't imagine are going to be very transformative. We need a policy debate that reflects reality. The policy debate is not about this reality, including even the fact that so much of this has been driven at the beginning from support for basic science in universities. And one thing that the, that the large companies do do is, we, we, and then we train people who have PhDs, and if there's not a lot of research support for them to do basic research on, they go and do applied research for the companies. That's where the jobs are going to be for them. So we actually need to, to have a policy debate which focuses on if we think these are going to improve our lives dramatically, how we finance this appropriately. I, I do worry a lot about that. Um, so we have some questions here. Um, one is a question I think we probably should address. Um, this is regarding the decline in dynamism and fluidity. Is the problem that businesses are more focused on increasing shareholder wealth than investing in risky uh, ventures? Now, this is not directly related to entrepreneurship, but I wonder, Andrew, you're sort of thinking about what kind of business models out there. Is, is shareholder value particularly driven by activist investors a good, um, a good environment for promoting the kind of uh, technological change that you think we should have? Is it discouraging entrepreneurship? I mean, what do you think? I gave a version of um, the talk that Eric gave to kick off today and showed some of these slides. And you can start to see this great decoupling happen starts to become visible to my eyes in the early 1980s. I was giving this presentation to the Open Societies Foundation, George Soros's organization, and he said, you're misattributing the root cause here. He said it's the rise of what he calls market fundamentalism, the, which he associates with the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, with the idea that the job of a company was to return money to its shareholders and not to think more broadly about stakeholders. So he was saying, look, it's, it's, that, it's that turbocharged, fairly selfish version of capitalism that's really causing a lot of what you're seeing here instead of any surge in technology. I think that's a really intriguing idea, but my career as, a, as someone who kind of tries to understand what's going on in the business world is on the order of 25 years old. Throughout that entire career, I have been reading about the excessive short-termism of American business and its over-reliance on this quarter and the bottom line and keeping Wall Street happy. The, the names have changed. That, that critique has really not changed as I've been reading it for two plus decades. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, I, honestly, Laura, I don't know how much weight to attach to that. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see that as a major factor here. And the most... Um, it, among the tech companies that I know, the most ruthless, growth-hungry, vicious competitors are also the ones who are investing the most in really basic and fundamental yeah. technologies. Yeah, so, so uh, this, is, these are, this is a hard set of questions, like all the ones we're about today. But um, again, I think there's evidence that historically, the major innovations have come not so much from the incumbents but, but from, the, from the newer businesses. So that's sort of kind of one concern. And then the second concern here is whether the, what, what, the, what the incumbents are trying to do, obviously they, they have an installed base of products out there. And so they are, this is, a, this is a concern that's shown up in both the economics literature and certainly in the popular press is, are they just trying to protect their, their and, and grow their market share? So back again, I said, maybe, maybe the goal now is not to be, be the next Google, but to be bought by Google. And the question is, what's Google's goal in that? Is it to actually uh, 
to, to take advantage of the new technology or actually to, to shut down competition. Those are the kind of concerns that, that fit into the kind of question that, that you're about. I, I don't know that we've got overwhelming evidence that that's what's going on, but, it, but it's not inconsistent with the evidence that we've seen this decline in entrepreneurship and we've seen this increased share uh, at, at the top end of businesses. Yeah, this. I, I spent half of my professional life here in Washington, but the other half in the private sector, um, 15 years of which 10 was in venture capital and the other portion in a couple of different companies. Uh, and I think you're right, Andrew, that it, 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 perhaps that's the, the core market drivers of uh, shareholder value or earning returns for LPs if you're a uh, venture capitalist. Nothing has changed. Uh, on the other hand, I think those are actually huge drivers. I mean, they are fundamental core drivers of every business decision that I ever participated in. And, and I, I just think um, the, the fact that, that, that uh, this unchanging uh, market-driven decision-making process, I think how it's grappling with this new set of changes in technology, maybe it's that nexus. And that's what's different. But, all the but, it, but I, I do think the premise of Laura's question, I think, is actually, I think, is really a core issue because it, 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 we do rely on the market to solve it. Right. Whoever asks. I mean, I, we do rely on the market to solve a whole host of problems. And I think we are in a regime where some of these problems are not going to get solved. But every venture, uh, capital, every venture capitalist I know encourages their companies to hit home runs, to swing for the fences, not, not to do an incremental innovation, not to do something cute. Because that's how you return to the, for the LPs, right? I mean, that's the, the business model for the venture capitalist, exactly. Absolutely. That's not part of the problem that we're talking about. I think that's a good thing instead of a, a bad thing. Well, but let me translate it to what actually happens when you have a small startup. So, you know, it, actually the conversation around the board table every single month is about the burn rate. Yep. And that is about not hiring too many people because you'll run out of runway before you actually get the product built and get revenue generating profits. So, you know, n n there's never a conversation about it would be really good if we could employ a few more people. That, that's only a consequence of achieving that hyper growth. Sometimes, once in a great while. Actually, I've, so. I've heard, I, I've heard uh, someone say, and it, there's, there's a kernel of truth in this, and it goes to your point about globalization as well. I've heard people say, so the U.S. has the very best incentives, this is comparatively speaking, until recent things like patent boxes in the rest of the world. We have great incentives to do the research in the United States. We have weak incentives to do the employment in the United States and very weak incentives to keep the profits in the United States. So basically you have a situation where all of the incentive structure in our tax law and a whole bunch of other things says, yes, 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 locate around great universities and start the Google, Apple's apps, everything of the world there. Don't to worry too much about employment. In fact, uh, except for the people you have to employ on your premises because you actually have to keep the premises going, you can actually do most of this work some other place. And don't worry about your revenues because you can put them in places where they're not highly taxed. So I do, I do think this issue of thinking about the employment effects, certainly, is not something which a uh, wealth generation, venture capitalist or non-venture capitalist has on the top of their agenda. It's not even on the agenda because labor is a cost. Exactly. I mean, yeah. <laughs> labor is a cost. It's not it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's a discussion of talent, and when you talk about talent, well, talent is something you want to acquire. It's not a cost, but if labor is a cost, and I think that's. Uh... Can I ask a question about DARPA? And you're, you're so, so you were both in and out. Do you think that, so relative to what John and Andrew were saying, you might think that the def rate of diffusion of ideas that uh, are generated in DARPA slow is slowing down. They're not being picked up. The private sector is not making the most of it. We used to say, in the Clinton administration, we were really worried about whether there was enough dual use technology to spill over. Yeah. Now we believe there's a huge amount of dual use technology to spill over, but is the recipient, the catcher, not there to catch? So what do you think? I, I, that, I, we think all the time about how our technologies are going to move out into the world. Some of them are very specific military systems, and they will only move forward right. through the DOD and the defense industrial base. But a number of the enabling technologies, uh, some among, you know, what we talked about today, but also in the information technology arena, do depend on 
um, graduate students going off and starting new companies or established companies adopting things out of basic research. But fundamentally, some, at some level or another, a business decision has to be made around a commercial opportunity. And, and I, you know, there, there was a time in DARPA's history when, uh, when we, you know, we, the, we were scaling the ARPANET and the Internet and, and the Cisco's and the Suns and this huge number of amazing companies was spinning out. Uh, from most, mostly from the university research that we were funding. I would tell you that I think that that is a very lumpy thing. DARPA's mm -hmm. been around, we're in our sixth decade, and there, there were seasons when there was a huge amount of that kind of activity and other seasons where there's only a modest amount. And it just ebbs and flows according to when those markets present themselves and entrepreneurs go seek those opportunities. It, it goes on today, but I wouldn't say it's at that level. There's no secular, so some of this is about whether there's been a secular decline in the ability of the private sector to, to pick this up and move I it forward. I, I, what I see, my, my sense is that it is much more about when entrepreneurs see market opportunities, and it's more that organic drive that, that fuels this big burst of activity, or then, you know, it, it moderates. Uh, some of the things I talked about today, we do see entrepreneurial activity, but it's fairly modest because there aren't, you know, 20 companies who see huge markets because yet. Too, because it's too, uh, still I too far early. from the market. Yeah. Whereas when you had the ARPANET, it got to the market and then blew out. And then, of course, in, in all of the social network, all the stuff that has grown up in the last decade, that, right. it, yes, would, would follow right, and, but, and just to finish about, you know, the ARPANET, the first decision at DARPA to put money against the idea of connecting computers was 1968. Wow. And it was 1993, as I recall, was the year that all of a sudden every business card you got had an email address right. on it, right? That's when the market really mm -hmm. started exploding. So, We've talked a fair amount about the decline in productivity uh, growth and the aggregate statistics. I think it's important to, to remember that the, 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 that same data says it's especially the high-tech sector that's had a trend break in, in productivity. So that it's declined since there, about, about 2003, according to the so very nice work by John, John Furneau. Mm -hmm. so, so that says, in terms of what, whatever DARPA happens to be doing, it's certainly not showing up in the in the productivity statistics since 2003. I, just, I really have to caution you. DARPA, DARPA is is 2% of federal no, spending in R&D. So just please be careful about <laughs> drawing okay. those extrapolations. No, I, 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 th I think that it's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make the point that I think Andrew could make, which is um, a lot of people do dispute the, the measurement of productivity from these kinds of technologies. So what sure. we heard this morning about yeah. how the retail sector may have you know, not shown any productivity increase because uh, you put in the machines but, and the people left, but there's no productivity. I, I would say that the quality of locating the product yeah. you want at the price you want uh, has really improved. So the quality of the shopping experience, the productivity of the shopping experience as measured by quality, may be entirely missing from the productivity numbers. So we really have a problem here. But, but, but the pr productivity has actually been growing pretty rapidly in the retail well, trade that, sector. That so so, that, so that, that, that statement this morning was, was off base. All right, well... And and and, act, but I, and, and in that in that case in that case actually it was actually it was uh, this is related in a good way to the decline in mom and pops the shift away from mom and pop to Walmart has actually been very good for the retail trade sector. So, but you would agree and with the, the and yes. for the consumer. So so my point whether the retail sector was the right one to use or not it wasn't uh, was is do you think that given the nature of the technological changes we're going through that a lot of this is not going to be measurable in terms of output per unit of input unless you do a huge amount of improvement on what the output actually I, is. I, I agree with this. We, we moved increasingly to, to parts of the economy that are hard to measure. The, v. Grelicus made this point yeah. uh, now a couple decades ago that says we're, we're, we're already back at 20 years ago moving and that's, that's, that's but, uh, you know, but, increased, and so, we, so I agree, our productivity statistics need lots of work. But the first thing that everyone says when the evidence doesn't support their theory is, yeah, the measure, we have very severe measurement problems. I don't want to rely on that evasion. Uh, I think the productivity numbers are weird, especially in the face of this idea that Eric and I are, are putting out there that we're in this technological surge. Mm -hmm. uh, so all I can do is fall back on the other um, evasion of somebody whose evidence is not supported is, Wait and see, because I do think. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the, but, but let me let me go on a little time. bit. The, the near future, I believe, is going to look fairly different, even in some of these very 
labor-intensive, low-wage service sectors that have seen growth in employment without much growth in productivity, and therefore big increases in their contribution to CPI, as Larry highlighted in the first panel. You talk about healthcare, which has gone from 100 to 600. There's a hotel, uh, sorry, a hospital that just opened up a little while back in, Laura, in San Francisco, mm -hmm. where every meal has not been cooked by robots, but it has been delivered to patients by robots. The dirty laundry is being carted throughout the hospital by robots. Automation is coming to these sectors. So this quickly. is a this is a, a good point on which to draw the panels together because the positive part of that argument is how much better you are off if, if you're a patient in one of these places and you're going to get your food well prepared on time by somebody who's not going to make a mistake. Okay? The bad news is that in every projection I've seen for employment growth in the United States and for other countries around the world, caregiving and health care is a major source of employment growth for, let's say, middle educated to low educated workers. If the robots are smarter and the robots can do it more precisely, then that's where you start to get to the issue we talked about earlier today. Who is going to be technologically displaced and what do we say as a society? If, if one of the most brilliant lines in the book uh, uh, that uh, Andrew wrote with Eric is, the essence of capitalism is that most people get their income from their labor. What if machines, what if brilliant machines take away certain jobs altogether and undermine the return to labor for a large fraction of society's workforce? That is a social problem that we have to begin to think about. And I, I really thank the Hamilton Project for having us all here today. I thank my very distinguished panel for forcing us to think about technology and business models and how could we get this to, to work better. Uh, it's been a great session. More to come. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. Nicely done.